Oh no! 
Hi, everybody. Good evening. Hopefully you enjoyed some of the island tunes while we waited a minute. And I expect there will be people continuing to arrive on a little bit more of island time. However, we do want to honor the time of our presenters and really of everybody who's taken the time out of their schedules to join us tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. So first of all, hello, everybody. Good evening. Good evening and actually good afternoon to good afternoon to those of you that are tuning in from from the islands not evening for everybody, but it is late evening for those of you on the East Coast. So thank you so much for coming. I wanted to just pause and really feel the, the gratitude that all of us at CAN feel for this event coming together and for all of those who have given their time to support it and participate in it. So a very warm Brananem Kasalelie. Ali'i, Yakwe, Lenwo, and Mangten. Thank you all so much for coming. I haven't had the privilege of meeting all of you just yet. So those I haven't met, my name is Kara Miller and the CAN board hired me in December as the executive director of CAN. I'm very, very honored to be here with all of you tonight. And since we have since we do have a, a mixed audience tonight, I just wanted to give a very brief background on CAN. CAN is the COFA Alliance National Network. And the COFA Alliance National Network was founded back in 2014 by community leaders who were advocating for access, opportunity, and social and economic justice for our COFA citizens residing in the US and the territories. CAN currently has chapters throughout Oregon, Washington, Arizona, and Texas. And we also advocate for COFA citizens at the federal level, as well as the state levels. We are very excited to let all of you here know that following tonight's event, over the next month, we will also be hosting language specific vaccine talk story events in all of the main COFA languages. So save the dates, save the dates and mark your calendars for the Marshallese language event, which will take place on May 20th or May 21st for those of you based back in the islands. And our Chukis language event will take place on May 27th or May 28th if you're back in the, if you're back in the islands. And they'll be at this same time, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Our Ponpen, Koshrayan, and Palawan and Yapis dates are still in the works. So please stay tuned for those. And without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over now to the FSM Consul General Joe Enlet to open up tonight's session with a prayer. Joe, I think you're on mute. Does that work? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Kara. Um, <clears throat> shall we pray together? Father, thank you for every virtual seat that has been filled here today. For each mind and heart that fills the presence of this virtual room, we thank you. Only you truly know what we are setting out to accomplish today. We have an idea, a vision, hints, and daily instructions. We have talents, abilities, and time to work. However, only you can see in perfect detail the end of every beginning, every project, every season, every life. Nothing is ever in vain. 
for even mistakes and missteps are used for good. Your righteousness transcends all our efforts and understanding. Therefore, we ask that you strengthen our confidence in you, in us, and in who you have made us to be. In your name we pray. Amen. Ali, good evening, everyone. My name is Bini Moses Masubid, and I'm from the island of Palau, and I currently serve as the CAN Vice President. As we begin this evening, I'd like to just give you a few things around kind of technological things we could use. And mind you, I'm not that tech savvy, but uh, we want to be able to know who's in the room. Um, we would love to if we were able to be together to um, have some chance to introduce ourselves but because of time we're going to be a, we're going to ask that you use the chat feature to do some basic introductions um, so in the chat um, please write your name what island you're from and where you're currently located it's always nice to know kind of where all our community members are so we appreciate if you do that for us tonight um, I also encourage you to write any questions and thoughts you have during tonight's event directly into the chat box. We really want to create a space where this is a true talk story. We also recognize um, different things. So as we have our speakers speak, um, we will be able to go back and look at some of those thoughts and those questions. If you want your question, or comment to be anonymous. Um, our IT person is McCray. I don't know if uh, he can kind of wave, uh, but you can send a private uh, chat to him and he will ask anonymously so you don't have to feel like you're really putting yourself out there. I'd like to also thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us for this vaccine talk story event. As you know, Pacific Islanders have been hit hard from COVID-19. It's very common these days and all too familiar that we know people in our families and our communities that have been impacted by COVID-19. We've seen the devastation and how it's impacted our people. And we um, have had to mourn many of our loved ones. So when we, we've been navigating how to be able to survive and continue to thrive given the huge impacts and strains that this pandemic has placed on our people and also our community. Which brings us to tonight. We're here together to participate in this talk story event. Tonight, the hope is that we start to learn about the, fa the facts of the vaccine, that we talk story and we encourage you to ask questions and ask as, um, as well as ask for clarifications if you don't understand or just need additional information. We're creating this space for you and all of us to be able to have an open and honest type conversation about the COVID-19 vaccines. And we're very glad we have people here who are gonna help us with that conversation. Given that we've been highly impacted, we hope that the information shared allows us to make informed decisions on the vaccine, which will help us get back to our daily routine before or pre-COVID. With us tonight are some very special guests who have been at the forefront of this work and are here to share their experiences, knowledge, and expertise. We would like to also acknowledge and thank um, our leaders who are here tonight, um, we have Deputy Chief of Missions of the Federated States of Micronesia, Mr. Jack Soram, who will be speaking um, soon. We also have uh, General Consul, or Consul General Joe Enlet from the Federated States of Micronesia based in Portland and also grateful for his opening um, our event tonight with the prayer. And then for all the, the leaders, the community leaders who are here, for all of you who are doing this work, um, whether we have a title or not, we know that you're doing and making a huge impact in your community. And I just want to express my 
deep thanks and appreciation for all of you, and especially for um, our featured speakers who we will provide introductions for along the way. And so as I shared, um, we have uh, with us the Honorable Deputy Chief of Missions of the Federated States of Micronesia, Mr. Jack Soram, who is here with us. And um, the Honorable um, Mr. Soram currently um, is uh, based in the FSM Embassy in Washington, DC since September of 2017. Uh, prior to his appointment as DCM, he served as the Assistant Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs, Asia, Pacific, Africa, and Multilateral Affairs. Um, Mr. Soram also served as DSM for the FSM Embassy in China from 2013 to 2016. He has been with the Department of Foreign Affairs since 2002, and he graduated with a BA with um, in Hawaii Pacific University. He's also an alumni of Xavier High School. And uh, I'd like to just acknowledge and thank you, Mr. Soram, for he being here and um, really ask you at this time to share some uh, a message and some thoughts to our community. Thank you very much, uh, Benny. And uh, thank you for the warm introduction and my greetings to all of you who are here tonight joining us. Thank you, CGL, for the warm prayers. That was uh, very moving, and we were grateful for you to start off our meeting with that. Uh, let me, first of all, bring greetings to all of you from, from the embassy, the FSM embassy here in DZ. Uh, on behalf of Ambassador Susaya, who's uh, unable to join us tonight, uh, and the staff and our families, we greet you, all of you, and uh, thank you very much for joining this very important event or occasion for CAN. I also want to extend greetings and appreciations to the uh, director or uh, Kara for the invitation extended to us and to, to the CAN board in, in a bigger picture for uh, in, including us to join you tonight. Now, when I was uh, asked to say a few words, the usual thing for us government officials is to write a speech. But I, I thought that was not gonna do because this is a storytelling event. So I just up to speak and hopefully I can just speak from, from my heart and speak of the, to the things that we will be discussing. So first and foremost, I want to say uh, on behalf of the three embassies here in DC, while my other colleagues are not joining me, I know their hearts are, are with you our citizens, wherever they are, wherever you are, throughout the United States or back in the islands, uh, we thank you and we welcome you uh, to, uh, in joining us this evening. Uh, I just wanna make sure that I convey this message that you're at three embassies here in, in, the, in DC to collaborate a lot. And we work together uh, just like we see your faces across the United States that you do also have that spirit of working together. So uh, I think that's important to put it out uh, at the forefront in our discussions. Uh, this is a really, really important thing for, for the FSM and for our communities all throughout the United States and even back home. United States. And you can see how this has become a priority for the United States government to the extent that so much assistance has been provided uh, not only to the United States uh, here in the US, but even to our communities back in the islands. 
And this is very, uh, it is a very good thing to think about because it, it brings us to the old notion that this, this COVID is very, very critical for us to address. And I, I cannot overstress that enough in my words and, and what I said, but I'm, I'm sure you understand. But here we are meeting this evening to discuss about vaccine. And I tried in my mind to think of what would be the best thing to say to this group. And I, I cannot say enough, but to tell you that your governments back home and here in the United States to place this very important. And I know for us, for the FSM, at least through the other groups that we work through, like the FSM COVID task force that is been created here in the United States, we try to facilitate the work so that we know our limitations as an embassy to be able to reach people, but we use uh, our networking through the citizens group to, to get the message out that we need to be vaccinated. I know there are stories out there. I know there's different media out there, uh, but I can only uh, ask you to trust the right authorities. And from that perspective, I'm referring to CDC and all the guidelines that they've put out there and get vaccinated. Uh, I think that's that's the that's the message that we want to we want to say, and I'm I'm very happy to say that your your uh, embassies have gone through most of us, like myself. I've done my second shot. I'm done. I know the other ambassadors have done their second shots too. They're done. Uh, I know some of our staff have gone to probably their first initial shots. But it's because it's important. It's it's very critical that we we get on it and we we get vaccinated. So if there is any doubt in your mind when you look at us, do know we are vaccinated because we believe in it, and we hope that the same kind of feelings and the same kind of faith and the same kind of sentiments will echo across the United States to our citizens to get vaccinated. And finally. Uh, in closing, I just want to thank our citizens all throughout, especially with the CAN group. I know CAN has been leading these uh, conversations for so long. And uh, we owe so much to, to the efforts of those who've put in the action for this group to be effective. Uh, I listened to the introduction of what you do in terms of finding access opportunity and social and economic justice for our citizens. And that's, that's a very noble cause for citizens to take on. And I can assure you, we make note of it from your embassies and from your uh, leaders who are around. And we're grateful for, for the, the efforts that you all have put in. Uh, this these talks this evening, if anything, it provides another opportunity to be partnered with you. And I can assure you of your government support. And with that, I thank you for the opportunity and uh, let's continue on with the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, DCM, Kiniso Chapur, for the really wonderful comments and for the thanks and for the encouragement to everybody who's here. We're so grateful to have, um, to have you here tonight. So thank you again for being here. And we will now move to our next very honorable speaker who we are so grateful to have him here with us tonight. And this is Dr. Sheldon Ricklin. 
And Dr. Ricklin is a Marshallese Koshryan who currently lives and works in Northwest Arkansas. And he's been over there for the last five years. He works as an associate professor with the Department of Family and Preventative Medicine at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. He also serves as a family physician at the community clinic in Springdale that serves a large patient population of Marshallese and other underserved populations in the Northwest Arkansas area. He is a member also of the Arkansas Marshallese COVID-19 Task Force. And with that said, we will hand it over to Dr. Ricklin. Como dada, Sarah, Kara, for the introduction. <clears throat> Apologies. Very honored and privileged to be joining among all of you tonight in this virtual platform. CGM, that was a beautiful opening prayer. Thank you for that. And to DCM Soram, thank you for your words. I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just gonna, you know, ask in the spirit of being this conversational. I just wanna, before we get onto the vaccines, you know, I just wanna give some facts. You know, I think, you know, we've been missing quite a few facts along the way and facts that become construed into other things. But fact is that there's close to 160 million cases global wide of COVID-19. Another fact is that there's almost 33 million cases of COVID-19 in the US. Another fact is that there's a lot of people getting it and dying from it and suffering from it, especially now in India. Another fact is that in the US, we have at least now three vaccines that we can use in the US. One of them being the Pfizer BioNTech, the other one being the Moderna vaccine, and the other one being the Johnson and Johnson. Fact is that these are all safe and efficient and efficacious vaccines. Fact is that I myself and my wife have gotten the Pfizer vaccine two doses. Fact is that our kids have all gotten the Moderna vaccine two doses and we are still here. We are all doing well. Fact is that our people, our Pacific Islander people, were affected by this devastatingly. That's, we cannot hide that. Fact is that many of the things that we need to do to fight this pandemic, to go back to what we were before, has to do with the public health measures that are scientifically proven. Fact is that we need to continue to wear our mask, we need to private practice social distancing, we need to wash our hands. And one of the biggest tools in our toolbox is the vaccination part. If you wanna protect yourself, you wanna protect your family, you wanna protect your community, the state, our islands, our elders, everything that we love about being Pacific Islanders, being Micronesians, we need to get vaccinated, that's a fact. That's the only way that we can get back to normal, whatever the new normal is gonna be. We know that the new normal is probably not gonna be the same as we used to do before. Okay? But this pandemic has definitely opened many of our eyes and many of doors. It's been challenging. We felt it. I think everyone on this virtual platform knows of somebody personally that got affected by this. If it's not just yourself, it's one of your family members that got sick from the vet, this virus. And just like with any other immunizations, we need to do our part and take the vaccines. Fact is that some people may have no side effects. Some people may have some side effects, 
but getting the side effects is a good sign. It means that your body is actually reacting to the vaccines to do its part in developing its immunity. And I'm not gonna go too much into details on the vaccines because I know Dr. Sharif is gonna go into that. But the fact is we all need to get vaccinated. We all need to let our family members know that they need to get vaccinated. If you miss the gatherings and festive activities that we used to do as Pacific Islanders, as Marshallese, or Shrines, whatever Micronesian part you're from, we need to get vaccinated. That's the best way to get to that stage. So I wanna thank Kara, Executive Director Kara and CAN Organization for inviting me to this forum. Again, I want to respect everybody and say thank you for having me and I will be available for questions later on in this forum. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Rickland for those wonderful and um, really important message. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Neil Palafox, who is currently a professor of family medicine and community health at the John A. Burns School of Medicine, the University of Hawaii, and a professor of population sciences at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center. Dr. Palafox is a member of four COVID-19 response teams for the state of Hawaii, including the Hawaii Marshallese COVID-19 Task Force, the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander R3 COVID-19 team, the Hawaii Emergency Medical Agency COVID-19 ESFA team, and the fourth team. St. John Vianetti COVID-19 team is the, the fourth team. He also worked with the American Samoa and Republic of the Marshall Islands reparation teams during the pandemic. Born and raised in Hawaii, he lived in the Marshall Islands and worked with the Ministry of Health for 10 years as part of the US Public Health Service. He was conferred Marshallese citizenship in 2011 by the president and the cabinet of the Marshall Islands through the referendum. So without further ado, I um, like to ask Dr. Neil Palafax to share um, a little bit tonight. Thank you very much. Uh... And uh, like uh, Dr. Wicklin mentioned, I'm really honored to be here and thank you for the invitation to um, share this platform with others. It's a very important uh, uh, place. And I want to say uh, again, Komotala and Kamagar and, you know, uh, Kasalilia for, uh, you know, all the different uh, um, things that you represent. So uh, one of the things that uh, I just wanted to give a few comments, my place here really as, is as a resource person, um, having worked with uh, many of the COVID teams and the repatriation teams in the um, several of the islands. And um, as a setting, um, uh, tagging on to what Dr. Rickland says is that you have very special communities. And you have to look at your communities as very special, uh, both back in the islands and here in the US. It's not one size fits all. So what you need to do and have to do might be very, very different from what uh, the white Americans have to do, black Americans have to do, you know, uh, Hispanics have to do. And you must recognize that and honor that because again, one size fits all. And to understand that, look at the world right now and Dr. Rickland alluded to this. Some countries like Hawaii is doing very well. Missouri for a while, just a little bit ago was getting hammered, you know, and, and so is Illinois. So even in the states, it's variable. The communities within the states is variable. And if you look across the world, you notice that in the beginning, India was doing not so bad. Now they're having death rates and problems that are over the top and they're in, total misery. The Philippines is having a very difficult time with COVID. Brazil is having a very difficult time with COVID. So the point is, every community is in a different place, whether it's worldwide or within 
uh, you know, the uh, United States. And so, you know, just to let you know, uh, if you look at the statistics in uh, the Pacific, all of your island nations, the Republic of Palau, Federal States of Micronesia, the Marshall Islands have zero community transmission, zero. It's because of what Dr. Rickland said. He said that it, it's on the community and what you do, how you respond. And I'm talking about zero. I work with them all the time. They have zero community transmission. Whereas in Guam and in uh, French Polynesia, they had a very terrible time with, with COVID. And so again, it's what you do and how you think that's going to prepare you for this. It is not, you know, just assuming that you're going to, you know, uh, ride on the coattails of the world. You have to invent your way forward. And talking about vaccines in particular, one of the things I want to mention is that, remember when the vaccines were put out, they called it Operation Warp Speed. What is warp? Warp is the speed of light. And all this technology is new technology. And they were pushing it out at the speed of light because they had to. They needed to fight, figure out some way to fight uh, COVID. So are there going to be issues? Yeah, there's going to be issues. But they did it in such a way to protect as many people as they could. And so Operation Warp Speed is exactly that. So it's one where in context of using a model, it's like you're um, building an airplane while you're flying it. But it's a necessary model to understand because uh, the COVID was going so fast, it's killing you know, millions of people. And so you can't be complacent and you have to then sometimes take that chance, not unnecessarily, but in a very smart way to know how you need to employ um, the strategies within your community. The science is moving um, quickly. So as you notice, every, every drop of the hat, you find out the CDC has a new recommendation, the NIH has a rec recommendation, they find a new um, type of, uh, uh, you know, um, problem with a vaccine. And also, I don't know if you know, but even the Chinese vaccine just got, you know how the United States vaccines got the um, emergency approval from the FDA, the US, the, the Chinese, the Sino vaccine just got emergency approval from the WHO. So are they any less, um, are they less of a vaccine? I would say not. But anyway, so, but it, it's to understand that um, different bodies accredit things in a different ways. You have to look at what your world view is and your, your politics are, but there's at least 60 vaccines that are being produced right now, six zero. And only uh, the Russians have their own, it's called Sputnik. Chinese have the Sino. There's all kinds of new vaccines coming up, but the ones that Dr. Rickon ta um, talked about and I think are gonna be talked about uh, in the future are the Pfizer, Moderna, and the J&J, &J, and there's even another one that's being pushed out in the United States, but I'll leave that um, to talk about. And remember, the epidemic is evolving. This is, there's nothing steady state about this. You know, the, the Pacific Islanders in Hawaii had two times the death rate and twice the hospitalization rate as more than anybody else in the Pacific, uh, in the island of Hawaii, they got hammered over here. And maybe some of you know some of these other statistics. Whereas I want you to think about what the Marshall Islands, FSM, and uh, Republic of Palau did. They have zero community transmission, zero. So what are they doing right? They are paying attention, I believe. And this was without the vaccine. Without the vaccine, they pulled this off. So if you think the vaccine is going to save you, that's one element, and Dr. Rickland talked about that, but there's elements that we already know about. It's using the culture, the behaviors, the recommendations that are well known, and to kind of use this as your, your, your armor to protect yourselves. And so I, I would just say that, um, uh, you know, uh, de designing a strategy, whether it's vaccines or anything else, is highly dependent on your own culture, who you are, your reach, and so forth. So again, I'm glad that you're here on this because it's anything but one size fits all. And you know, if you think that um, 
one size fits all. You can see what's happening not only in Brazil and India and so forth, but the United States, Hawaii, Guam wasn't able to do what FSM, Republic of Palau and the Marshall Islands were able to do, and American Samoa, by the way. It was because they figured it out and did what they had to do early on. It had nothing to do with technology. It was before the vaccines. So anyway, I will just stop here. I'm here as a resource person, but I just wanted to frame this in a, in a larger perspective of uh, part of the gamesmanship and understanding is to know the science, know these different technologies so you can develop what you have to do for your own community in your own way in your own time because you, you can and have to. But I will just stop there and thank you very much for inviting me on here and I, I will stay on as a resource person uh, over. Um, thank you very much, uh, Karen, and others for letting me be on this or Benny. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Palafox Mahalo. And wow, I, um, I certainly am already learning from, from both of you. And I really appreciate that framing and the larger perspective, especially because we do have some people calling in from the islands. And I know that most of you have family and friends still back in the islands. And I do think that it's important to link the conversations. I really appreciate that context you just provided and thank you both so much. And, um, and thank you, thank you as well participants for using the chat. That is so great. Okay, so we will now move on to our next speaker, who we're also very, very grateful to have here with us tonight. Um, Can has been very fortunate to be brought into a lot of conversations with the Oregon Health Authority, which is the state of Oregon's authority on health. It's our state government um, health department that deals with, with all things going on right now related to COVID and the vaccines. And I was lucky to hear, doc, to hear Dr. Sharif speak at another event. And so I had actually personally hoped that she would be the one from OHA uh, participating tonight. And so I'm so glad and grateful. Thank you, Dr. Sharif, again for joining us. Dr. Shimi Sharif is a physician and a senior health advisor working at the Oregon Health Authority as part of the COVID-19 response. Shimmy identifies as part of the South Asian community and is honored to be here engaging with all of you around the vaccines and answer your questions. So I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Sharif. Hi, Kira. Thanks for the wonderful intro. I wish I saw you on this call that you saw me on, but it's nice to meet you in person or as close to in person as we can get. Um, I wanted to thank uh, everyone for including me in this panel. It's um, quite humbling for me to be here. Uh, I really enjoyed um, listening to the prayer and the words of Consulate General um, uh, Enlit, uh, Jack Sorum, and Drs. Neil Palafox and Dr. Sheldon Bricklin. Um, I certainly wouldn't have minded if they wanted to get into the vaccines right away, but uh, I'll sort of fill in those gaps. I do see the question in the chat, uh, but I'll wait to answer that because I do uh, have a couple slides on how to address that particular concern. Um, I can pause right before I have a set of slides addressing common misconceptions and questions and see if the, we have organic questions coming from the audience. And if it feels relatively silent, I can kind of move through those slides and then stop at the end. Um, so with that, I'm going to share my slides. All right. Can everyone see? Sounds good. So to start, 
I'm gonna go through a general agenda. My introduction, my name is Dr. Shami Sharif. Uh, I'm a nephrologist by training. So I've been trained in kidney disease and I work for the Oregon Health Authority currently working as a senior COVID-19 health advisor. So we advise uh, medical protocols and state health policy on a variety of topics related to COVID. Um, I'll go through the current vaccines that we do have here in the United States, uh, a couple of slides on efficacy and safety, uh, Dr. Palafox uh, alluded to that. Uh, I'll pause right before that FAQ section um, and see if there are any questions, otherwise we'll proceed through. So this webinar is not intended for members of the media. Uh, to connect with us as a member of the media, please contact this other address. So I just wanted to start uh, by kind of giving credence to a couple points that other folks have made on this call. So COVID-19 has uh, unfortunately disparately impacted several communities uh, in the United States. And of that, uh, the Black and Pacific Islander communities have been really hard hit. And specifically our Latino communities have been hardest hit in Oregon. But I just wanted to um, highlight these numbers here. So this is age adjusted mortality sort of assuming that all of our ethnic groups here in Oregon have the same population um, density and distribution that people are of relatively similar ages. It does show that Pacific Islander Oregonians are uh, two, four and a half times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19 and uh, 14 to 17 times more likely than uh, white people in the state to be hospitalized or die from COVID-19. And that takes us to the vaccines, which are, uh, someone mentioned, one of several toolkits that we have uh, to, to fight this pandemic. Specifically at this time here in the United States, we have three vaccines authorized for use. That's the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. While the development of these vaccines did happen relatively quickly, uh, it did happen because of a very specific reason. Uh, there was a lot of uh, private partnerships built to study certain technologies such as the mRNA vaccines well before we entered this pandemic uh, and specifically in the areas of cancer therapy as well as Ebola. So there was prior research to inform the way we approach this pandemic and the urgency with which it was uh, affecting all of us. With that said, I'll walk us through some slides on vaccine efficacy. So the mRNA vaccines to start, so the Pfizer Moderna vaccines were the earliest vaccines to be authorized here in the United States. The mRNA vaccines specifically give our cells instructions on how to make a harmless protein that's unique to this particular virus, also called the coronavirus or the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Our bodies recognize the protein that should not be there and fights off the infection. And mRNA technology has specifically been used for over 10 years in several different cancer therapies and research. The adenovirus vector vaccine, and specifically the example that we have here in the United States is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, is a type of altered form of a different virus, specifically a cold virus that's been used to contain the instructions for the same protein on the coronavirus. Uh, to be able to bring it to our bodies to then instruct our bodies on how to make antibodies to, ki uh, to kill that virus. So specifically the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and related vaccines have been studied for decades and used in the Ebola vaccine that's been authorized by uh, the European Union since 2015. So what's not in the COVID-19 vaccines? Um, so the COVID-19 vaccines, um, contrary to other popular information on social media, does not contain fetal cells. Um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine does require the use of cells um, grown in a laboratory from original fetal cells from the 70s and 80s to be able to grow the virus that can then be used as the, uh, the vaccine by which we're treating uh, and preventing coronavirus. It does not contain animal products. It does not contain human products. and Finally, it does not contain microchips or any other, um, any other substances. So 
I have a couple slides on how the vaccines work, uh, but for sake of time, uh, I'm going to uh, provide the links here. But if folks have specific questions on how these vaccines work individually, I can go through them later. So the COVID-19 vaccine trials recruited across a large number of geographies and uh, people. So Pfizer and Moderna were primarily US-based trials. Uh, they were based, uh, Pfizer was about 75% recruitment from the United States and Moderna was 100% recruited from the US. Uh, there were 30 to 40,000 people recruited each relatively equal numbers of uh, men and women in these trials and uh, relatively similar uh, demographics across various ethnic and racial groups. So specifically, if you see um, Pacific Islanders were actually captured under the Asian category in these particular tables. So they would be captured under the 4.4 and 4.7% across the two and older adults similarly at 20 to 25% between both trials. Johnson & Johnson has very different demographics because it was, while it was still predominantly in the US, about 48% of their participants came from uh, various United States. Uh, the rest of their recruitment did actually come internationally. So Brazil and South Africa made the bulk of their recruitment that was international and then much smaller numbers coming from Colombia, Peru, Mexico, and two other countries. Um, male and female recruitment was relatively similar and maybe a little bit more predominant for men. Um, and similarly, um, the recruitment across the other racial and ethnic groups was very different just because of the geographies represented. If we look at the subsection of participants that came from the US, it was actually very similar to the Moderna and Pfizer, but overall they actually did have higher numbers of uh, people identified as Black and higher numbers of Native Americans just because and Latinos as a result of uh, the recruitment and the geographies represented. Older adults formed about 20% of their overall recruitment. So the COVID-19 vaccine, specifically the mRNA vaccines, um, currently we have two of them, Pfizer, Moderna, separated about three to four weeks apart. They both contain two doses and they have very similar vaccine efficacies, 94 to 95%. And they were tested against moderate to severe disease across the two, specifically symptomatic COVID-19, having at least two or more symptoms. So Pfizer and Moderna specifically were tested in the summer of 2020 when we still have relatively high numbers of what we call the original strain of the virus. So both vaccines were only tested at the time of their trials against the original strain because they were done earlier in time. Uh, we don't have definitive data against the other variants for these vaccines in human trials, uh, but we do uh, are currently um, collating the data that would come from our vaccination efforts across the US as we go along. They're both highly effective at 94 to 95%, about two weeks after the second dose of vaccine. We don't currently know much about the duration of immunity after vaccination, but we do have some reports that Pfizer uh, has noticed nine months of immunity, if not longer, with the Pfizer vaccine. So the adenovirus vector vaccine, specifically the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, is currently a single dose vaccine. Um, they tested again a few different outcomes. So one was moderate to severe disease, um, about 66% when you look at it between both outcomes, and then specifically for severe disease, about 85% effective. Specifically, Johnson & Johnson was also tested during the winter of 2020, uh, while there were multiple different surges across the different populations studied. So specifically, the US was in the middle of a surge, as was Brazil and South Africa. And again, three different strains of the virus, just by default of the timing. At that point, we did have high numbers of circulation of the South Africa variant in South Africa, as well as the P1 or the Brazil variant across large parts of South America. So Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, was 93% protective against hospitalizations at, when measured at two weeks, and this number did climb to 100% when looked over four weeks. Uh, it was highly effective at uh, severe disease, about 85% against the three strains tested. And similarly, effectiveness starts about two weeks after the dose and has been studied up to one month after. Uh, there is, however, evidence of antibody protection, uh, production that continues to increase until about day 56, just from the trials alone. So that's about eight weeks. 
So which vaccine should you take? So the main thing is all the authorized vaccines are very highly effective. I think Dr. I think it was Dr. Palafox who mentioned that we've already created such great suppression of COVID-19 without even using vaccines. And that's really from the collective efforts of social distancing, masking, washing our hands. And so what vaccines do, it really gives us that extra layer of protection whereby we can start to relax some of those other very difficult measures that we've been all taking for over a year now. So the main thing about all the vaccines is they're, they're all very protective against the main thing that we worry about. I'm sorry, this is a little bit small, this slide, but they all work really in terms of getting uh, preventing us from getting very sick or dying from COVID-19. They've all shown very strong protection against all the COVID-19 variants to some degree. And the more vaccines we have available, the faster we can all get vaccinated and the more lives we can continue to save. Currently, as far as authorizations go, the Johnson & Johnson currently is one dose authorized for people 18 and older, similar to the Moderna, which is also two doses, but authorized again for 18 and older. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is currently two doses given to 21 days apart and is currently authorized to 16 and older. And as of yesterday has now been authorized by the FDA to ages 12 and older. The one thing that we are still waiting on after the FDA authorization is to get a review and assessment by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which is, uh, which is a key committee that we wait on before we start um, distributing vaccines across the multiple states. And with that, let's get into safety. So the side effects of all vaccines that we currently have, um, I think uh, somebody did allude to this earlier as well, is most people will develop a sore arm and that's easy enough to treat. You just move your arm, keep the blood flowing in that arm. Most people will get tired and some people will start to get headaches or some very rarely will get fevers or chills. And this side effect is actually very rare. It's about less than 15% of all people actually get fevers or chills. But main thing, if you do feel sick or if you do feel like it's kind of a mild fever or even up to a high fever of 101, is to take it easy. The main thing is if your fever does go up to 102 or higher, it's best to call a doctor at that point. Because the one thing to note is that between your doses of vaccine, you still have a very, um, you still have a likely chance of getting exposed to COVID-19 and it's important to recognize those symptoms if they do happen. And the main thing is also muscle aches and soreness are very common from the vaccines. Um, and the main thing is to take a pain reliever if you do need it, but most people will either develop only very mild muscle aches or not at all. Um, finally, the main thing to note is that the vaccines in very rare circumstances can call trouble breathing, uh, but these do occur very quickly after the vaccine dose is given, and this is definitely a reason to call 911. Then the other reason to also be uh, concerned about trouble breathing is, again, if you've been exposed to a respiratory virus such as COVID-19, either right after your dose or between your doses of vaccine, it's important to recognize and get medical care right away. So rare side effects of all these vaccines, um, I just touched on this previously, is anaphylaxis or is a severe allergic reaction. This happens in about two to five out of every million people for Pfizer and Moderna. This is based on the reporting that we generally recommend all providers report to the states and the federal uh, government agencies, including the CDC, so that we can keep track. In Oregon specifically, out of a uh, emergency room case review, we have noticed this uh, case rate can be about 10 people in every million uh, have gotten these side effects. No estimates are currently available for Johnson & Johnson just because we haven't distributed quite as many doses. Vaccine providers are therefore trained to observe individuals for at least 15 to 30 minutes after vaccination to safely treat anaphylaxis, specifically these allergic reactions, if and when it does occur. So the main thing that everyone has a question about, including uh, in the chat that I referenced earlier, is the risk of Johnson & Johnson vaccine and specifically the blood clot that's been described and has been thought uh, potentially due to the vaccine. 
So the main uh, issue that they noticed with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a type of blood clot that developed in the brain and specifically in about 17 women that received the vaccine out of over 8 million people that received a dose, which comes out to about two people in every million. Compare this to the risk of COVID-19, given that this is a very, very rare risk, uh, the risk of actually getting any type of clot with COVID-19 is a lot higher. It's about 4,000 times greater than that. So to summarize, it actually is more likely to get struck by lightning in one year than to develop this rare side effect as a result of Johnson & Johnson. And it is actually far more likely to get sick from COVID-19. The one thing to note is that although the risk in the general population came out to about two in a million, that risk is slightly higher in women ages 18 to 49, which is where most of these cases occurred. And that risk does go up to about seven per million. Still very rare, but relatively more frequent in that age and um, sex group. So that's uh, something that the FDA has labeled the vaccine, just so that people are aware. So what about safety reporting after vaccine trials? So what's important to note about all this is this was a great confidence booster to know that all of our safety reporting mechanisms are working so that we were able to identify a side effect as rare as this so quickly after the vaccines were already out and in such a small group of people relatively quickly. So the main thing to note is that safety reporting does happen both during a trial as well as after a trial. Rare side effects such as these uh, particular blood clots can take many more people to get vaccinated to be able to identify and are reported through this uh, reporting system called VAERS. So every state enters their reports of any potential side effect, including those that might not be related to a vaccine to the reporting system, just so that the CDC is aware and able to investigate. So the main thing to note is not all these reports to VAERS are thought to be from the vaccine itself. Most of them actually fall under unrelated side effects because people can develop COVID-19 after one or both of their vaccine doses. And most of these cases are very mild. And also people can have other risk factors that cause other types of illness. So people have medical conditions that might be unrelated to their vaccination and they could get all kinds of illness that's completely unrelated to the vaccine. But if it does happen within two weeks of the vaccine dose, we do still encourage providers to report those just to be safe and just to be able to investigate every potential avenue, even if a lot of them might turn out to be unrelated. And vaccines and variants specifically, so vaccination does help to reduce the emergence of variants by killing and neutralizing the virus before it has a chance to replicate. So I know there's a lot of information on social media claiming why get a vaccine if we have ongoing variant transmission, but the main thing to note is that any vaccine related immunity is a lot better than the immunity that our bodies naturally have. And vaccination before you actually get exposed has a really good chance of actually killing that virus and letting it not spread through you or your loved ones before, and it nips it right in that bud. So early and effective vaccination does reduce ongoing variant transmission. That's really how we kind of keep, keep up with the variants before they have a chance to take over. And finally, children and COVID-19 vaccines. Another concern for people is that these vaccines have been authorized in adults before children, almost promoting more suspicion. Why are these vaccines not safe enough for children? So the reason that vaccines uh, are slower to authorize in children is because they do have to give consent to be enrolled in a trial. So the process is slightly lengthier. The other reason specifically with this disease is that children seem to be suffering much less severe disease than adults. And the urgency was really in getting adults, specifically adults with either medical conditions or over the age of 65 vaccinated quickly so that we could re really reduce the, um, the real like toll of this illness. Um, so what we have noticed though, as a new update regarding this process is that while the Pfizer vaccine was already authorized for use in 16 to 18 uh, at a younger age group than the other two vaccines, the Pfizer has now received an EUA for the ages of 12 to 15 as of yesterday, May 10th. 
Children is not as severely impacted by COVID-19, but trials are currently underway in children as young as six months of age. And really the reason is to reduce the spread to their older family members. Even though the children themselves might not get very sick, they can still be able to pass the illness uh, to other people who are more at risk. What are some of the other benefits of getting vaccinated? So we're getting, um, kind of a sneak peek into how life is going to look like post vaccination. So a couple benefits here is if you do get your COVID-19 vaccine, you do prevent yourself and your loved ones from getting infected is just one more protective strategy that you can take. It does help us to get to community immunity and safeguard all our vulnerable neighbors, uh, people with other medical conditions. It does make sure that our schools, businesses, and communities can reopen safely. A couple of things that have actually suffered as a result of COVID-19 is appropriate access to mental health services, substance abuse services. A lot of services have had to shut down or go to extremely reduced access points because of the restrictions we've had to make. So there have been other sort of indirect effects of COVID-19 that we're just starting to realize. And finally, it puts us one step closer to ending this pandemic, just getting all of our protection up and be able to open up our societies accordingly. So there's some individual level benefits that we are starting to see is we are able to do a couple of things safely without masking. And that specifically refers to being able to gather with our loved ones, um, especially those with maybe less burden of illness or less um, uh, issues with like immune compromise is and we're able to gather fully in private settings. Uh, we can visit with unvaccinated people from a single household who live away from us as long as they're low risk for COVID-19. And you can also conduct activities outdoors without a mask, uh, except for basically being in crowded setting and venues where there is actually higher risk just because of the numbers of people collecting. And what you can continue to do while wearing a mask is um, visit with unvaccinated people of more than one household. So there is a little bit more protection for vaccinated people to be able to do that. That's something we definitely advised against before. And then also like visit with an unvaccinated person who might still be at high risk for severe COVID-19 because you yourself might not be a huge threat to them. But it is important to realize that the vaccinated person um, may be exposed to a small, much smaller degree from an unvaccinated person. So it's still um, good to manage that risk and make sure you yourself aren't at very high risk from the other individual. Quarantine requirements are much looser for those who have received vaccination. So you don't need to quarantine. And by quarantine, we mean if you've been exposed to somebody with COVID-19 and you currently don't have symptoms, then we say that you don't have to uh, watch that period of 14 days where you can't go outside and do your groceries and go about your normal life. Um, we say that as long as you remain without symptoms after your vaccine, you don't need to quarantine and you can actually um, just go ahead and just do travel or do other things as you normally would. And then the other thing is also your travel capability is a lot easier after vaccination. A lot of states, including, I, I believe all domestic states, um, maybe someone can correct me if this is different from Hawaii, are not actually requiring testing to enter um, each state, if you're vaccinated and you can show proof of vaccination. And similarly, when you do arrive in the other state, you don't have to show proof to be able to not quarantine after. I'm going to pause here to see if there's anything specific that's already coming up. Questions? Anything care in the chat? Thank, thank you, Shimmy. I did copy and paste the two chat. The first okay. one, the first one was a comment, but I think it'd be great if do you want me to to read it right now or do you want to go into anything else first? Um, sure, I can hear the comment. And if there's like a slide that's going to get it, I'll just kind of keep going through my slides. So this comment, there wouldn't necessarily be a specific slide, but mm -hmm. the 
question you did see that I think you mentioned from John Acapito to all of our physicians here today with the temporary setback with the Johnson's vaccine and its blood clot issue, what are some ways to continue convincing our loved ones and communities to get vaccinated? Let me stop share and kind of answer that. So um, the main thing I think has been hard for people to wrap around with the with the information about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is how to be able to actually contextualize that risk. What does that risk actually mean? Um, and the it's important to realize that the risk is actually really low. Um, but at least we know that it's there and it, it really kind of points to, wow, we were actually able to pick up such a low risk, but we were able to pick it up at such a low number of cases identified. And part of the reason is because some of that investigation did occur because of AstraZeneca. And so we do have the experiences of our global partners informing our safety and our vaccine strategies kind of as we go through this pandemic. But the main thing to realize is that COVID-19 is unfortunate reality that we're all living through. And the risks of COVID actually, unfortunately, far outweigh a lot of the, the side effects, um, even the ones uh, that we think might be related to the vaccine have shown so far. And that's the understanding with which these vaccines were authorized because the benefits do very much outweigh the risks by a lot. Um, so like I think I pointed to that slide about 4,000 times more likely to get COVID-19 in a clot than the side effect from Johnson & Johnson. That said, we are in a uniquely privileged setting um, in this country to be able to have the choice that we do have between three different vaccines and to be able to choose another vaccine if the side effect from the Johnson & Johnson is an unacceptable level of risk. Somebody, oh, I guess Kara mentioned another individual benefit is that we can travel back to the islands as soon as the borders open. That would, yeah, technically that I think might be still international travel. So I'm hopeful that we'll get to that second layer of reopening pretty soon. Dr. Sharif, I, I have a question that is kind of connected to a chat that was made earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the, um, I think the comment was around um, kind of the after effects. And you spoke about this a little bit about the benefit of the vaccine. Um, but can you talk a little bit about, uh, we've seen a lot of messaging that come out around how our body is reacting is a signal that it's working. So can you talk about, um, you know, some of those things? Yeah, sure. Um, so yes, that is correct. The reason that we develop some of these side effects like the fever, the, um, the sore arm, all of those actually point to the fact that our immune system is recognizing the instructions given by the vaccine and able to start creating antibodies and also get our cells, we have immune cells that actually recognize viruses too, and just get them ready and primed to go kind of fight infection if and when it gets exposed to it. So um, it is common that a lot of people, especially under the age of 55, will develop those side effects more so than a person over the age of 55. But even among the younger age group, it is very variable. Like for example, I got the Pfizer vaccine, both doses, I barely had any side effects, um, none of the traditional side effects, which was, you know, a little bit disappointing for me. I was like, oh man, I thought I was going to have side effects. But, but the main thing, it is very variable. It's just not 100%. Uh, most people will have that sore arm, uh, which is already an indication that your, your body is recognizing the instructions that we gave it. And it really kind of is just getting ready to go because that's where the bulk of um, the vaccine goes into is that uh, is that muscle either in the arm or the thigh, depending on where we give it. Dr. Ricklin and Dr. Powell Fox, do either of you want to comment on either of the questions slash comments that we just mentioned before we move on? Uh, Sheldon, I can go first, or you can go first. I have a comment that uh, I don't go ahead, know. Yeah, so I, I think um, uh, for many of us, uh, and me included, and you know, I teach medical students as well, and one of the things that, and talk to many community folks, is this understanding what risk means. 
And so when we talk about it decreases your risk or a vaccine has 85%, it's good 85%, I think one of the things that um, uh, folks need to understand is I think people are looking for sometimes a perfect solution. So they want to get something that is 100%, meaning 100 out of 100, you're going to be protected. And two, there's no chance of side effects. Well, in life, uh, th there's no such thing. There's people who die every year from taking aspirin or Tylenol. And uh, just to give you an idea of risk and the kind of risk we take, in the United States, uh, this is a 2019 data, in the United States, 38,000 people a year die from car crashes, okay? Does that mean you're not gonna get in your car? No, you are all willing to take that risk. And further, there's 4.4 million people who have severe, I mean, severe injury from uh, car crashes every year. So, uh, but we're willing to take that risk, right? Jump in our car, we go and, but that's actual statistics. And in fact, um, ages one through 54 in the United States, you know what the leading cause of death is? Car crashes. But so for some reason, that's an acceptable risk, but the kind of risk that's very, very small from the vaccine, people go, whoa, 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 I, I don't wanna take that. And it's, it, but I think it's helping them get their head around what risk actually means. Risk is saying that um, you're willing to do it for very specific reasons. One is you're gonna protect yourself, but the larger one is you're willing to take that very, very tiny risk because you're protecting your family and community. And to me in the Pacific culture, that's the bigger one, that by doing it, it's not about yourself, it's about your entire community. So taking this tiny risk and there, nobody can tell you there's no risk, that, that doesn't exist, but it is a tiny risk. It's nothing compared to the car risk or anything like that. And then um, another uh, aspect to uh, understand is when someone says uh, uh, a vaccine is 85% protective, so you don't end up, let's say, in the hospital, what that means is if you line up uh, people who have no vaccinations and you give them uh, the vaccination that, uh, and you, you, you infect them both with COVID, the people with the vaccine are gonna be 85 out of every 100 will not have significant hospitalizations. That's what that means. Versus the ones who don't have the vaccine is gonna be a much higher rate. So it's not zero, but you can see, um, and that's the, the honesty, but I think it's to help the, the communities understand what risk is about. It's not zero, it's taking a risk because you're protecting yourself and your family and from spreading. And, and that's what it's about. And, and, and also there is no 100% anything. Uh, you know, there, there's no vaccine like that. People die from, you know, allergic reactions to different things all the time. And it's a fact of life from bee stings every year for goodness sake. So it's one where um, to help the community understand what risk is and that it's a necessary part of, uh, you know, taking prevention. Now, if we were to look at the, the compact nations and what risk did they take about shutting down their borders? The risk they took, the politicians took, is that people that are from the country that were abroad would hate them from doing that. People that went left, that couldn't come back in, they'd miss their families and all of that. Their economies would be suppressed, but they took that risk but you know what? They're COVID free. So again, nothing is a zero, uh, you know, you, there's always something that happens when you take a risk, but some risks are worthwhile taking. And I think to me, that's part of the message. And I just wanted to share that because it's not just about statistics and 85%, 90%. It's why taking this risk is important for the community, again, Every year in the United States, 38,000 people die from car accidents. But every one of you is going to jump in a car afterwards and you're going to drive. It's, it, because that's worth your risk. And there's going to be 4.4 million more than 30,000 that are going to get severe injury from car accidents.
but we all take that risk. But anyway, I just wanted to frame it because I think understanding vaccinations and testing and all of that in the era of COVID, it's, it's really understanding what risk reduction means and who you're protecting. And, um, and are you willing to do that? And, and that's a question that your community and you as individuals have to do it. You can't promise anybody it's gonna be zero. You can't because that's not true. But anyway, I just wanted to put that in as a framework for, for getting vaccinated, not getting vaccinated, which one you're gonna take and so forth. So, uh, so that's, my, that's my two cents over to you, Sheldon. I don't know if you want to add anything. Well, well, Neil's two cents. I mean, I have nothing else more to add. I mean, I think he perfectly and very eloquently explained it. And so, you know, between what the information that Dr. Sharif explained and what Neil had just mentioned, you know, there you go. Um, I wanted to thank you both because that is important to see, you know, like all the risks that we take just kind of going through is just that we're unfortunately having to take more risks than we ever have before. So just our baseline level of risk just with having COVID in our communities is just far greater risk than we've ever had to deal with and ever had to basically make peace with, which is what we've had to do over the last year. We can, we can reduce our risk in a variety of ways, but it's still more risk than we as human beings have ever had to take. And I don't think it's, um, I don't know if it's fair to us, I guess, to have to keep taking it. Um, that does kind of go to this question. A common misconception among the community is that once you're fully vaccinated, you don't need to worry about contracting COVID-19. So they are discouraged that when they see on the news, social media, word of mouth, that some people are still getting the virus after vaccination. So the main thing I just wanted to kind of hone in on is that while we have these statistics, 85 to 95% effective, that really reduces, that's the amount of risk reduction that happens with every encounter with COVID-19. Your actual risk of COVID-19 still really depends on a lot of factors. Who do you live with? Who are you exposed to? What kind of work do you do? How many people are living in your household? All of those things inform our personal risks, but anything that reduces that risk by such a high number, 85 to 95% is probably, you know, a really good thing for all of us. And then the other thing to note is that while, you know, we have these sort of um, this data and this information about potential side effects, one thing to note is that in the UK, um, they're able to look at this data a little bit more closely and come up the numbers, but they have noticed about, about 3.75 million UK residents that have gotten COVID-19, about 1 million of them are still struggling with the long-term effects of COVID-19. We don't even know what that number is in the United States because we don't have the same universal health care system or the ability to keep that data in that close range. But that's a scary statistic. And so these are people who've survived COVID-19. This is These are the people who haven't lost their lives as a result of COVID-19 and who still struggle with the burden of illness well up to a year after their original illness. Um, so that's something to kind of also note because what kind of risks are you reducing for yourself and the people who might get sicker that you're exposed to is that sort of ability to lead a normal life after COVID-19, even if they were to get exposed after vaccination. There's um, one more question. Um, and I wanted to uh, pose this to doctors Palafox and Ricklin also. So thanks, Dr. Sharif. With the variety of variants circulating in the US, how effective are these vaccines in protecting individuals from these different variants, especially the newly discovered ones? Also, how long does the duration of the vaccine effectiveness last once an individual completes their two doses? So my assessment is that we're still trying to figure out how effective the vaccines are towards all the variants. We, uh, at this point, don't have a lot of clinical data. We do have a lot of laboratory data indicating that there's still antibodies produced, but maybe in lesser numbers for the South Africa and the Brazil variants. So that's specifically the B1351 and the P1 variants. And how long does the duration of the vaccine effectiveness last once an individual completes their two doses? We think at this time, and this is mainly based on the Pfizer experience, is that these vaccines do confer immunity for up to at least nine to 12 months, potentially longer. So we're still tracking this information as we go. And we're quite, uh, we're not quite at a year even after 
Pfizer, but like, you know, after the original trial enrollment, but we'll continue to get this information and make it public as we go. Anything else to add? Yeah, um, if I may, uh, just again, to uh, look at the variants and so forth, I think um, one of the things again about the nature of this pandemic is the science and the nature of disease is unfolding as we go. There's lots of things we still don't understand about it. So there's variants that are happening. There are side effects that are happening. There are new vaccines that are evolving. They're even looking at some new treatments right now. A lot of them didn't work, but they're still working on that. But I, I guess the point is um, to depend on what we do know. So what we do know is the vaccines work. And do they work against all variants? Maybe, maybe not. But we do know it works in a very good way against the predominant virus that is with us now and that's killing people. And we do know that. Um, do we need to get boosters in the future? Maybe, maybe not. But it's, again, this pandemic has only been going, what, a year and a half now? So, uh, and as you notice with the flu vaccine and other things, you need boosters every year, right? But it's because we have that track record. So I guess my point is, is to feel somewhat secure in knowing that what can be done and what you can do, you do. It, 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 it might, you know, tomorrow or the next day, it might say, oh, you know what? These three new variants came out and the Pfizer and Moderna don't protect you against that. But you know what? That's tomorrow. Today, we know what it does and what it can do for you and your family. And so therefore, Go for it. That, that would be my half a cent. Go for it because that is a fact. Like, you know, Dr. Rickman was sharing facts. That's a fact. Whether or not it protects you against a new variant, we don't know. Whether or not you need a booster three years from now, we don't know. But if you want to protect you and your family now against the main event, that's what these vaccines are designed for. And currently, because we don't have the crystal ball, we can't predict the future. You, you do what you can do and, you know, and what you can do certainly is you put on, can put on a mask and social distance. That's a fact too. But anyway, I just wanted to frame it like that because a lot of people say, well, I do, I, because I don't know about variants or because I don't know if you need a booster or because I don't know how this vari uh, virus is going to evolve in the future. Yeah, we, you know what? We don't know all that, but that's the name of the evolution of a pandemic. So uh, over to uh, you, uh, Dr. Ricklin and uh, uh, Dr. Sharif. So I'm just gonna interrupt really quick. I have a Facebook. We're also streaming live on Facebook. So I have a question that's coming in and it's asking all the physicians, the, um, do you see a need for a third dose of uh, getting vaccinated if we don't reach a certain percentage for the vaccine? for a vaccination? Um, I can take that. So like the third dose might be what we refer to as a booster dose. So like because two of these vaccines already have two doses, that third dose might be referring to that. Um, and we might need those booster doses depending on how we how long we end up finally seeing that the immunity lasts for after the original two dose vaccine series. Uh, but it wouldn't necessarily be prompted by the fact that the pandemic doesn't end at a certain point. I think um, at this point we do know the pandemic um, is going to get better. But in terms of completely eliminating the virus, um, I don't think it's very likely in any sort of short term duration. Anything else, Dr. Zwicklin and Palafox? No, totally agree with you. And, you know, Dr. Palafox is half a cent is like a billion bucks. Um, but, you know, you definitely make a really great points. And again, I think for us humans, you know, it's uncomfortable not to know all the answers. So when we say we don't know if you're going to need a booster, you, you don't like it. You know, that's part of our human nature. But, you know, this is COVID 2019, right? This is COVID-19. It just came, it's a new disease. So not just the public, but medical students, residents, doctors, specialists are learning it as we go. Right. So many other things that, you know, we're doing and we're saying in terms of boosters, because the studies are still ongoing. I mean, as of this point, we can say at least 
there is immunity for the Pfizer for at least nine months. We continue to study it as the days go along. Um, but you know, you're, we don't know many of the questions. We don't know many of the answers to the questions that many people are asking and wanting to know. But the best chance for everybody and to stop variants from developing is basically ending the pandemic. And how do you end it? Is continuing all those you know, public health measures, including vaccination. So we can stop it, stop the spread, stop developing the variants. Thank you so much. That was such an insightful thing to think about. Um, I want to also just um, make note of what Kara put in the chat box. If you're like me, I by the time I finished drafting my sentence in chat, I lost my thoughts. So if you're one of those people, you just want to say something, use the raise your hand feature so we can see you um, and ask some questions. Um, I'd like to, um, I think Lisa Perman at one point had uh, their hand raised. So if you're ready for your question, Lisa, want to go ahead and ask it? Oh, Beanie, I already um, asked it in the chat, uh, the misconception mm -hmm. around uh, being fully vaccinated and still getting it. So um, Dr. Sharif touched on it, but thanks. <laughs> Great, thank you. I think what gives me hope um, about um, the vaccine and what we're doing right now is the fact that our communities are involved in at least um, kind of communities, uh, cultural communities that it is where we're having these conversations, but that we see role models in our community. Um, one of the things I saw, maybe it was a comment that brought something to mind was, um, um, thinking about sometimes as a community, we have this mindset that could be around, um, you know, not wanting to take the resources away from other people or feeling like we're not deserving because maybe systemic barriers have made up steam. And so I'd like to see if the physicians can talk about kind of the cultural um, nuances that may um, be things for us to develop a mindset of deserving this vaccine and deserving these resources as part of uh, our community needing to uh, live and thrive. I can start off with that. Um, I can tell you that you know we're we're a very special community. We're a very special group of people. You know, I, I can tell from experience, not just here, but also in a way in other places among our Pacific Islander groups that even before it hit us, we were already worried about our people. You know, we already were doing action. We were already planning. We were already talking about how do we keep our community members safe? How do we take care of our people first? Not even thinking of grants or funding or anything else. How do we do it as a local Pacific Islander community? In Northwest Arkansas, you know, it's like, you know, okay, we, as we're hearing about all these risk factors for those who's going to catch it and get sick and getting admitted and to be in ICU and dying, we were just hearing what them talking about our community members. Those, we add all those things. So, of course, as like any Pacific Islands, we got into a village meeting, right? We call each other and we talk to each other. How do we take care of each other? How do we get the messaging out? Because you know, most people, I mean, there's definitely really smart people out there, but most of our people want to hear from us, right? They want to hear, they hear your voice, hear our, your language, the culture, the face, and say, and then answer the questions. So I think the mindset for our Pacific Islanders is, you know, besides being resilient people, I mean, we've we're wearing Guams in Arkansas, right? During the middle of winter. So, you know, we're adaptable. Everything that we do is all about the family. So the mindset is basically, you know, for us as a village to gather and beat this pandemic and it's basically to do it together as a village. And, you know, I think that's one of the unique features that we have that even other people that are not Pacific Islanders and they look at us and they go, wow, 
And even before, when they heard what we're organizing, they're like, can we be part of that? Because we want to learn how do we address the needs of our patient population or people that work with us who are, who are Marshallese or Pacific Islanders. We need to learn from you. And you know, us being very, always wanting to share and share with others. You know, I think that's where it came from. So when they saw that, they knew that for them to actually address many of the things that they're trying to address, they need to address our needs and our people in our culturally appropriate way. That's why we're very deserving of this, of this vaccine and everything that we've been doing. That's my two cents. And thank you, thank you, Doctor, for your your hundred dollars. Um, but um, I like to add to that, and I'm going to flip the equation on you. And, and and this is not meant to sound harsh, but you know, um, you are multiple cultures within a larger culture, the U.S. culture, and the U.S. culture. Uh, again, this is my opinion, but the U.S. culture is very self-centric you guys are community not self-centric so if you do not advocate for yourselves you will be left behind because they already you're you're in their shadow and you know i, I don't know how to say it any other way but and i can give you an example in hawaii when they did um a lot of the um uh testing the COVID testing and when they handed out vaccinations the the systems weren't designed for pacific islanders it was all in English, they had to have, uh, be able to navigate online. Uh, you know, everything was about the majority culture. It wasn't about the Pacific Islander cultures and we, where they were at. Even the vaccinations, I can tell you, you know, um, in Hawaii, unless Dr. Rick, uh, Dr. Ricklin well, and Dr. Um, Alex said, you know what, uh, to the Kaiser folks, we need to not have these public things you know, way out in wherever, we have to go into the community to do what we have to do because that's how you get the community to respond. It's not by putting something and say, okay, everybody show up or call on the phone or call the central line. One, they couldn't speak the language. Two, they couldn't navigate the, you know, signing up online, any of that. So my, my point is, is that um, as a culture advocating because the larger culture I hate to say it, it doesn't advocate for you until it's way late. And then all of a sudden they get on the bandwagon, like Dr. Rickley said, oh yeah, we have to take care of these guys too. But that's why you see the differential and who gets hit the hardest. The people who get hit the hardest are the people who are, um, who, who are on the side, they're on the sidelines. Pacific Islanders are one of those groups. And you know, and again, it's, it's not, it, it's just the way the, world works, I suppose. But I just wanted to make sure that that's part of it. And and you you always, you know, ever since I've worked in martial arts and certainly known Sheldon and I knew his dad and Wilfred Alec and his dad and many of your fathers, I saw a Pretrick on here. I don't know if Dr. Ilio Pretrick was related to you, but I knew him in Pompeii. But anyway, the, the point is you're so humble. You're so uh you know, wanting to share and uh, that sometimes in a larger culture that doesn't share that belief, you can unknowingly get left behind. And so to flip that model and say, how do we get what we need? And um, again, that's something that I'll share with you for from a vaccination standpoint. In the Marshall Islands, they were having a lot of vaccination hesitancy. You know how they got around that? The Ministry of Health went door to door with the vaccines they had, you know, of course, they all speak Marshallese, right? They would ask the people at their door, do you have any questions? No, yeah, whatever it is. And if they said no, okay, are you willing to take the vaccine? And the vaccine team was right there. Boom, vaccine, sign them up. So again, it was a very proactive understanding the culture and how the culture works and, and adjusting to that. And now they have a pretty good vaccination rates, but it wouldn't have worked if they said, okay, um, everybody come to Madro Hospital when you're ready. Doesn't work like that. But anyway, I just want to say, advocate for yourselves. Sometimes other folks don't advocate for you until maybe it's too late. And certainly every structure that has happened that I've seen in Hawaii 
it certainly wasn't, uh, you know, uh, you know, promoting Pacific Islands. And then even I can tell you this, and I probably shouldn't, that even the vaccine distribution to all the U.S. affiliated Pacific, the U.S. affiliated Pacific had to come together and strongly go to Washington and say, you know, we deserve this. And that's how they got the vaccines. They, they weren't even in the mix. Like, oh, we're going to give this much to the Marshalls and to FSM and to even Gu Guam and so forth. They were left out of the equation. So jump in there, you know, a little bit of mixing it up. And I don't mean in a negative way. But anyway, uh, so that's how I'm flipping the equation to say that sometimes humility that makes you wonderful. And it is a great asset. But sometimes in certain situations, you want to go, you know, let, let's kind of expand that idea a little bit. So over um, back to you, Sheldon and Dr. Sharif. I didn't have a whole lot to add because I'm not part of the COFA community, but I did want to acknowledge that um, I think our systems are failing people if they feel undeserving. Um, and I kind of recognize how, you know, if you're marginalized, you have to find ways to adapt and kind of accommodate to, you know, sort of mainstream American culture. But my belief is that's not right. Um, I think we're still putting the onus on folks at suffering the most from this illness and from healthcare disparities in general. Um, and I think that's really, I think what we really want people to be able to do is to kind of create that links to their accountable structures, including government to sort of demand the change that they want to see if they're not already seeing it. And I wanted to acknowledge that a lot of our vaccination efforts have always come too late when it deals with, you know, sort of vaccinating the people who are actually like suffering the brunt of illness because we set up mass vaccination sites but we don't actually do culturally specific vaccinations uh, and culturally accessible vaccinations until often many months in. We're thankfully at that point, at least in Oregon, where we are making very key strategic partnerships to create vaccine access, because I think we can only do so much with hesitancy if we don't really meet community where they need us to, to be able to create access similarly. You know, I, I often tell some of the folks who are trying to work with us, you know, that we need to reverse the mindset. You know, if you really want to talk to us or you really want to be with us and take care of us, you know, instead of asking us to come to you, you need to come to us and sit down on our mat and say, how do we work with you? Because, you know, the only way you can work with us and make a difference is come and work with us you know it's the community the community are the experts really it's not the department of health it's not ums it's not anybody else they are the experts in knowing exactly what they need to get things done to change their mindset so you need to communicate with them and getting all the different groups to be part of the planning from the onset and go through all that and education things and vaccination events and whatever it is that you need to do. You need to involve the community members. I think that's very important. A true talk story just goes and goes and goes. However, I'm doing my best to respect the time of especially our speakers here tonight, one who is on the East Coast. So I want to give one last opportunity for the floor. If anybody here, anybody at all, has anything else they'd like to say or offer or ask. Tara, may I? Yeah, uh, thank you very much once again for the invitation for us to participate and to be part of this wonderful event and this wonderful forum. Yeah, you're all doing a great job. Uh, 
I just want to add my voice to, to those that has been said, you know, you listen to these experts, they are scientists, they are doctors, and they know, they know the science behind it. But if there is anything that I can add to the voices that have been said tonight, I'll just ask you all, do your part, protect yourself, protect your loved ones, protect our community. Like Dr. Glenn said, we are a special and unique community and we, we know we can do it. So spread the word, help each other out. Let's all be responsible. Thank you very much for the opportunity and good night. Thank you. Thank you so much, DCM, Soram. And I do want to say there are many, uh, many COFA leaders here this evening from all different parts of the states, Washington, uh, we have David Anatok here, Utah, we have Melsina here from Micronesian Women Together, United Micronesian Women, and others, and others that are leading their own communities and organizations in similar initiatives. So we are so um, grateful. And, and CAN is just trying to also do our part in this collective effort. And this is the first uh, of that. So again, just a, a friendly reminder, May 20th will be our Marshallese language event. We will have Dr. Ricklin again, as well as another Marshallese physician, Dr. Alec, who I know was mentioned tonight, who's based in Hawaii, also joining us for the Marshallese event. And then we'll have our Chukis event on May 27th with some other amazing speakers. And the rest of the COFA language events will be set as soon as we have all of the details in order. So please stay tuned for those. Just the warmest thank you to everybody for being here and, and your time and your engagement, um, especially to our speakers. So I'd like to now hand this over to John Acapito, who will close us in prayer. And thank you so much, John, for your leadership and stepping in last minute to close us in prayer. Tara, you're a true Micronesian. You believe in last minute. Um, uh, real quick, thank you, Kara. Congratulations, great, great job. And uh, I just want to once again thank you to all the all our physicians tonight. Thank you very much. This was really good. And Dr. Palafox, I love that car metaphor. I'm going to start using it with my relatives, especially the stubborn ones. <laughs> So we're gonna close our very productive meeting tonight with a prayer. Uh, CG Joe started us out with a very beautiful prayer. And thank God prayers are not, you know, uh, a performance contest. Otherwise I would decline to, to do this, at least from God's perspective, so I believe. Um, so with that, let us pray. God, our Father, come all that. Kuloma lalap, kalangan kaburumui, kini so jabur, kam magar, akmal mesulang. Thank you for life, for everything, and especially for this very productive meeting tonight. Please continue to bless us as we each go about doing our duties in helping your people and all of your creation. Bless our physicians, especially those who were able to join us tonight and all the healthcare folks throughout the world. Father, we also pray for all of those whose loved ones have died from the pandemic. All of these we ask in your holy name, amen. Thank you.
Thank you so much, John Kiniso Chapur. I just want to offer that I'm going to stay on the Zoom space for a little while longer. So anyone is welcome to stay on a little bit longer if you'd like. And that's all I have. That's all that we have for you. I'm again, just so happy that we have people all the way from Pompeii to DC who are here and everywhere in between. That's really, really exciting. And I really also think that's what CAN is all about. So I'm so happy for uh, the participation from you all. Thank you, everyone. Very nice to see you all.